Have you ever wanted to read through the Bible? I mean, the Bible is such a great book, but where do you begin? Today, we're on a new series called Through the Bible, and we're gonna be reading Genesis 1 through 11. Get ready, this is OneBillion.org. OneBillion.org exists to give one billion people an opportunity to know Jesus. Our goal is to share Christ in every country around the world. You are welcome to join the movement that is touching the world. Let's reach the world together. Welcome to One Billion, my friends and family. We're so thankful for you, and we believe that God's going to move in your life today. And this is why we're here. We're here to worship Jesus and also to know God and also to grow in our relationship with God today. You know, here at One Billion, our ministry is simple. It's to help share the good news of Jesus around the world. And we do this every day, reaching mobile phones in over 192 nations. And many people are giving their lives to Jesus. It's pretty amazing. Well, we're so thankful for you. Well, today is your day for God to do a miracle in your life. My friend, Pastor Andrew, is going to take us through the Bible. And we're on a new series, Through the Bible. That's what it's called. And today we're going to be opening our Bibles to Genesis 1 through 11. Are you ready? Let's read the Bible together. Before I received Jesus in my life as my Savior, my life used to be sad, emptiness, feeling unloved, and broken life. I live in condemnation because the curse of witchcraft in my family. But now after accepting Jesus Christ, I have peace, joy, and love. Jesus came to die on a cross to give me a new brand, new start. Jesus loves you. Welcome to Through the Bible. Oh my goodness, can you imagine? This is the start of our journey through the entire Bible. What? kind of emotion do you have as you get started today? I know that I am so excited because we're going to go on a journey through every book of the Bible. We're not just going to read the same verses over and over and over. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, each week, I'm going to be giving you an overview of what we're going to talk about. So in Genesis 1 through 11, God creates the universe in a methodical and orderly manner. And then he creates man to look after it. But as a result of man's disobedience and rebellion, also known as sin, God's loving creation becomes extremely dark. Even in the midst of this obedience though, this is what I want you to focus on, we can sense God's love for mankind and his desire to be with them and to save them. God delivers a flood on the earth, but Noah and his family preserve humanity. In Genesis 1 through 11, we witness the contrast between God's goodness and man's sinfulness, as well as how God desires to restore, have relationship with man, and bring humanity unto himself. Well, let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. So the first thing that we have to start with is it says, in the beginning, God. Did you know that the whole Bible is about God? God is the main character of the Bible. It's not us, it's God. And as we start, we want to learn more of who God is. Remember in this section, we're asking one question. What is God like? So think about that as we're going through this message. What is God like? Well, the first thing that God is like is he is a creator. God creates the world. And sometimes we can get confused on how the days all go together as we read through it. Like, you know, he separated this and he put this together and did this and he filled it. So the way that you can remember the days is first God forms the earth and then God fills the earth. What was that? God forms the earth and then he fills the earth. Now, as a creator, it's important to know the word create, there's two different types of it. And the one used in the Bible is a very special type of create. And this is the same word when it says God created mankind. He created you in his own image. One definition of create is to take existing materials and build something out of it. So if you're gonna build a house, you take a bunch of raw wood, two by fours, and you nail them together and you create a house. But with God, he created what we can see out of no raw material. He created it out of nowhere and out of nothing. 
And so the world was formless and void. That's what the Bible says. But what's cool is when we find ourselves in impossible situations, nothing is impossible for God. There might not be a road out of the situation that you're in right now. You might not feel like there's a way out of what you're going through, but God can create a way out of nothing. He doesn't need materials to do that. So we can know that with God, nothing is impossible. He is a brilliant creator. Genesis 1:27 says that. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. What an honor that we are created in the image of God. That is so special. In the image of God, he created them male and female. So who is God? Well, in an existence with no form, with no purpose, God thoughtfully created the earth. He created everything that exists, and that includes you. God gives everything meaning. What does that mean? It means that your life has meaning. You aren't here by accident. Just the fact that God created you should tell you that God loves you and he knows you. The Bible says that God, later on in Psalms, knits us in our mother's womb. So what happens next? In Genesis 2, Adam and Eve are given free will. God puts them in a garden to tend the garden, but he says you can't go to the knowledge of the tree of good and evil and eat the fruit from it. You know, this is where God gives us free will. He gives us autonomy. He gives us the ability to make choices. And you know what? That's how we learn to love God back. God gave you freedom because without freedom, there is no love. God could have made us robots, but he wanted us to have this certain freedom to choose to love him back. And you know what? With that sense of freedom comes the opportunity to do wrong. Deuteronomy 30, 19 says this best. It says, I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. So basically he's saying, I have set before you the ability to do what's right and to do what's wrong. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. God wants us to make the right choice, but we can't make the right choice if we don't have a choice at all. God is the one who gives us our free will. And it said this, and the Lord God commanded them, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. This is a God of freedom, choice, and relationship. Now, when we go to Genesis 3 and 4, we're going to talk about the fall and God's redemptive covering. Now, here's something interesting to note. When Adam and Eve took a bite of the apple, what did they do? They immediately hid from God. The Bible says that they were guilty. It said that they were uh, covered in shame. So what do you do if you feel exposed and shameful? You hide. And that's what Adam and Eve did. They were completely naked. And for the first time, they knew they were naked, so they hid. And what did Adam and Eve try to do? They tried to make a covering of the fig leaves for themselves to cover their physical nakedness. This is when, when mankind had sinned and started to feel the effects of the fall, the effects of choosing the wrong thing. Remember, God gives us that wonderful gift of choosing. But here, in the midst of humanity's shame and guilt and need to hide, God does something amazing. God actually covers Adam and Eve. Genesis 3.21 says, The Lord God made garments of skin from Adam, for, uh, for, not from Adam, for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Yeah, he didn't cut into Adam. That's good news, right? Many of us think that that's what God's like. So he made a covering of skin. What does that mean? It means that God had sacrificed an animal and covered them with his sacrifice, not their own. What happened later is absolutely horrible. We are introduced to what happens, the spiraling effect of sin. In Genesis 4, we're introduced to Cain and Abel. Now, Abel was working with some of the farm animals and Cain was working the ground. And it said that Abel was able to give God this amazing offering with like the fat pieces attached to it. Now that sounds really weird because if you think of eating a steak, you don't want the fat on there. But for God, it was something special. It said his, his gift was thoughtful and he, he spent time getting it prepared for God. But Cain, it said that he gave him some of what he had harvested. So Abel brings this beautiful offering. Cain kind of like haphazardly throws something together. And God says, well done, Abel. 
What a beautiful offering and it pleased God. And then when Cain came in, Cain quickly threw something together, kind of threw it to God and said, hopefully this will do. Now, Cain was jealous of Abel, so he took him out to the field and he said, let's go out into the field and spend some time together. And this is the first murder in the Bible. Cain killed his own brother Abel out of jealousy. Do you see how sin continues to snowball? It continues to get worse. After the first murder in the Bible, God asked Cain, what happened to Abel? And he covered it up. Now that's a whole nother level of guilty. You do something wrong and then you could apologize for it. But instead of apologizing when asked about it, what did Cain do? He said, am I my brother's keeper? Is it my job? He covered up what he did. But this is something that we see in God's redemptive character. And that's the main thing we're focusing on in Genesis 1 through 11. Man's sinfulness versus God's goodness and his holiness. See, this is what God did. Cain said, today you're driving me from the land. This was his punishment for what he did. He drove him out of the garden. And he said, I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. But check this out. The Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. What was God doing here? He put a covering over Cain. You know, we all make mistakes. We're not perfect. But what was God saying here? He was saying, I want you to know this character trait about me. I am a redemptive God. You know, God is just. He can do whatever he wants. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But God, in his own heart, decided that he was going to redeem us. You know, that's important when we feel like we've fallen so far away from God and like he can never forgive us. The truth is that God in his word says that he will forgive us if we ask for his forgiveness and he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, one of the most important verses in Genesis 1 through 11 is Genesis 3.15. And this is when the snake was tempting uh, Eve and Adam to eat the fruit, to eat the apple. Now, he was convincing Eve that God, God wasn't uh, was convincing Eve that God wasn't on her side, that he was holding back things from her, withholding from Eve. But that was never the case. God never did that. But the enemy wanted to try to convince Eve that the God's character wasn't for her, that he didn't love her. And that's one of the biggest things that we struggle with in life. We have a wrong image of God. That's why in the section we're saying, you know, what is God like? God is redemptive. God is loving. God is thoughtful. God has a plan. In Genesis 3.15, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, he's talking to the snake, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you strike his heel. You know what he's referring to there? He's referring to his son, Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman, that Jesus Christ would one day come and completely destroy the works of the enemy. So who is God in this section? God is our merciful redeemer. He looks past the things that we've done and he says, you know what? I'm willing to choose to redeem you out of the situation. That is a God of love. And so after this, it just continues to get worse and worse. In fact, Genesis 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 5 says, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thought of the human heart was only evil at that time. How sad is it? God actually said, I regret making the earth. I regret making these humans. He was so heartbroken. Did you know that God has a heart? God has a heart. God has feelings. The Bible says Jesus wept. It said that he was scared. It said that he was frustrated. He said there were so many examples of Jesus feeling what we feel. He's a compassionate God. And so what happens? Noah is commissioned as the new Adam. This is what it says in Genesis 6, 17 through 18. Behold, this is God speaking to Noah. I, even I, am bringing a flood upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything on the earth shall perish. This was God's judgment on sin. By the way, judge, God is free to judge. He is the creator. That's part of his character. And if sin isn't judged, then what happens when someone who you love is murdered and the judge says, just toss it out? That is not good. God is a God of justice, but a God of love. He says, but, now here's where they come and they marry together. I will establish my covenant with you and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. God had every right to completely destroy the earth, but instead he saves it through Noah. 
you know, I heard a pastor once say, um, you know, why do you think the Bible's so long? And I was thinking about it and I was like, I really don't know. And he's like, think about all the times, especially in Genesis, where Adam and Eve sinned, uh, Cain kills Abel, Noah ends up getting drunk, the people start building a tower out of self-sufficient, like, why does, why is the Bible so long? Like, how, why do these things keep repeating themselves? And he said, he said this to me, the reason the Bible is so long is because God is so merciful. The reason the Bible is so long is because God is so merciful. God had the opportunity to destroy the earth and to start fresh. He didn't need us, but he wanted us. God wants to have relationship with you. You know, when you're at the bottom, when you're at the bottom of the tank, when you feel like the stuff that I've done is so bad that God can't forgive me, what I want you to do in that moment is to look to God's greatness. Look to how good he is, how merciful he is, how redemptive he is. God wants to redeem the situations in your life that went south. God is powerful and strong enough to do it. Instead of just condemning yourself and self-criticizing and just kind of lowering yourself down and filling yourself with shame and guilt and trying to cover up and trying to hide, look to God's goodness. You know, we often think I'm down here and God's up here. But that gap between us is mercy and compassion and redemption and love. Uh, Romans 5, 8 it said, God loved us and died for us while we were still sinners. So while we were in that condition, God was still loving and God wanted to redeem both you and I. You know, as I was going through Genesis 7 through 10, there were three things that I picked up on uh, about God. And I want you to just write these down. Remember, we're asking the question, what is God like? So anytime I'm saying something new about God, go ahead and write it down. Anything that sticks out to you. Um, in Genesis 7, 4, this stuck out to me. God is a God of clarity. You know, something that God does a lot in the Bible is before he does an action, he'll tell you what's going to happen ahead of time and he gives you all this clarity. So he'll go into great detail by saying, your generation will be enslaved for 400 years and then someone will redeem them and move them to the promised land and they will be given to your children. Like he goes all out on his promises and he makes things clear. You know, sometimes we think that God isn't clear, but why do we have the Bible? God wanted to make sure that we knew who he was and what his plans were for our life. So Genesis 7, 4, you can go ahead and look at that verse. It reminded me of how God is a God of clarity. The second thing I picked up from the section was that those who walked in close fellowship with God are highlighted in the Bible. Did you know that? I really loved um, reading Genesis 5, 23. Uh, where it talked about Enoch. It actually said that Enoch lived 365 years and he walked in close fellowship with God. In fact, he walked so closely with God that he didn't die. He was like the only person who didn't die. He was taken from earth by God. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine getting to the end of your life and God just swoops down and picks you up? He wanted to, he wanted to say like, there's such a blessing on those that closely follow God. We see Noah also walking closely with God and God makes a covenant with him in Genesis chapter six, verse nine. So I want you to think about that. God loves those who walk closely with him. That is the key in your life. You know, sometimes you get dry spiritually and you think, I ought to go read the Bible. I ought to go do this. I ought to go do that. I should be doing more evangelism. I should tell more people about him. No. God wants to be with you. It's in God's presence that you get strong. If you get in God's presence from reading his word, that's wonderful. If you get in God's presence by praying, that's awesome. If you listen to worship music and you feel God's presence, that is what you want. God loves being close to us. And the third thing that I realized in the section was in Genesis 7:18. And God here makes so many promises, but not only that, he keeps his promises. I can't even begin to tell you how many times in my life I have gone through a situation that looked like it was impossible. I had no idea what was going to happen and God spoke this audaciously powerful word and I was like, there's no way that's going to happen. Every single time it happens, literally every time without fault. Um, God told me uh, years ago, uh, he said, you're going to see as many people saved in your lifetime as Reinhard Bonnke and I said, that is foolish. He saw like 100 million people saved and it's actually starting to happen. Like When God speaks these clear things to you, he's not telling you to go do it on your own. He's telling you what he's gonna do in the future. And that brings us to the last point, the tower of self-sufficiency. 
You know, we think that we have to go do stuff for God all the time. Not true. God is actually going to show you how that works here. So I call it the Tower of Self-Sufficiency. The Bible calls it the Tower of Babel. Man, in the beginning, remember Adam and Eve, they tried to cover up for their sins. And now, what is man doing? It has spiraled out of control. Man is trying to do great feats on his own apart from God. He's not doing it for God's glory. In fact, in this Bible, or in the Bible when you read it, it said, let us make a tower for ourselves that ascends to the heavens. You notice man is always trying to make his way up to heaven, but God is always making his way down to man. That's what separates our faith. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to deserve it. We don't have to build a big tower. We don't have to do special things to get God to love us. He already loved us. He already chose us. And he is going to redeem everything that we've done. So we need to depend on God and not ourselves. So my friends, that takes us through Genesis 1 through 11. Now you might be saying, what do I apply from this section? What's something that I can take away today or this week or this month and I can, I can move with it? Well, this week it's gonna be a heart shift. It's gonna be a mind shift actually. Um, I want you this week or, or today to settle in your mind that you will have an accurate and biblical view of who God is, an accurate and biblical view for how God is. Remember the snake in the garden. God is withholding from you. God doesn't want you to be. There's so many lies that we have in our head. In fact, we end up creating our own God in our mind that's different from God as he is. And I like to call that God in our head. We have this idea, well, he must be really mad at me. God really must hate this about me. No. God is madly in love with you, my friend. He is going to redeem you. He's going he's to lift you up. He's going to give you a great purpose. Remember, God took nothing and made something out of it. He's going to do that in your life. So as we gear up to get into Genesis 12 through 50 next week, I want you to remember that. See God as he actually is. What is God truly like? No one is born with the capacity to love themselves. I didn't love myself. I always sought to receive love from other people. I kept feeling incomplete and hated every part of myself. You can't love if you don't know real love. God is love and he demonstrated this by giving his only son Jesus for me and for you to show you the true love. Friends, if you're here today, it means that God has a great plan for you. Today, you may be asking yourself, how do I know God? How do I start a relationship with God? Well, you're in the right place. And the greatest decision you and I can make is to receive Jesus Christ in our life and start that relationship today. Today, I want to walk you through four simple steps about how to start a relationship with God. What are they? Number one is love. Number two is sin. Number three is Jesus. And lastly, number four is to pray. So let's go to number one. Number one, love. Do you know that God loves you so much and has a plan for your life? The Bible says this in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him will not die, but have eternal life. Would you like eternal life today? God's giving you an opportunity to have salvation and it's a free gift, which we're going to learn about. You know, this leads us to step two, and that's sin. What is sin? Sin is all the bad things that you and I have done in life. And the, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That means that you and I are sinners who need a Savior. And it's our sin that separates us from God. And if we die without forgiveness, we'll be separated from God forever in a place of eternal torment and wrath, which is bad news. But here's the good news. Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago and died upon a cross to deliver you from the curse of sin. He came to die, and then on the third day, he rose again to give you and I a new life in Jesus and have a forever relationship with God. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6.23. Today, would you like to receive forgiveness? Would you like to have hope in your life? Would you have, like to have a relationship with God? Well, this leads us to our last step, and that's to pray. So let's pray. Wherever you're at, let's pray and invite God to come into our life right now. Dear God, I thank you for, your, for the, your son that you sent to come to die on a cross for me. Today, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that I am a sinner, and today I repent. I need a Savior. Forgive me of all my sin. I pray that you'd forgive me and make me new. 
Now fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to walk with you from this moment forward. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, my friends. You've just made the greatest decision of your life. You now have a new heart. Your sins are forgiven. You have a great future in God and you have a home in heaven. God bless. Unreached people are those who have never heard the name of Jesus or met a Christian. They live in closed countries where Christianity is persecuted. Does this make them impossible to reach? Now with OneBillion.org, you can reach across borders and reach people's hearts through mobile phones. And you don't even have to leave your home. It's simple. Chat with a OneBillion.org team member today and customize your global outreach. You can even pick the country too. Do you have a passion for Jesus? Are you looking to start a ministry of your own? Are you also wanting to know how God can use you to touch and reach your nation? Well, we're excited for you to become a missionary at OneBillion.org. You know, at OneBillion, we exist to share the gospel with a billion people. That's right. And over the past two years, Jordan and I have traveled to 24 countries. We actually filmed 170 videos, which is crazy to think so about, crazy. in 40 different languages. And every day, thousands of people are watching these videos and hundreds are coming to Christ. But now, we want to take what we've learned and we want to give it to you. Since we officially launched in 2018, over 60 million people have seen a 1 billion video ad online. 30 million people have heard the gospel and over 175,000 people have received Christ into their life. And now we want to teach you how to reach your nation for Christ with the gospel, but how is that possible? Andrew and I want to send you a kit. Now this kit is so amazing because it comes with a 4K camera and with this camera you can film testimonies in your nation to reach people, thousands of people online for Christ every day. So how does it work? Well, the first step is you receive your equipment. You unpack it, you shoot the videos, and then you upload it to onebillion.org. There, we're going to edit it, put it online, and people are going to start responding to Christ. Are you interested in becoming a missionary to your nation? If you are, fill out an application. And also, if you want, you can send us an email at info at onebillion.org. We're excited to be working with you. We can't wait. It's going to be amazing. God bless. God bless. Get trained for ministry. You have what it takes to become a world changer. OneBillionSchool.com has trained thousands of people just like you to accept the call of God to transform nations with the good news of Jesus Christ. Now is the time for you to step into a season of faith and power. Now is the time to walk in God's plan for your life. Apply now. It's 100% free. OneBillionSchool.com Want to share Jesus online but don't know how? We believe every person can be a witness for Jesus. LinkU.co empowers you to share Jesus on your favorite social media sites like Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. LinkU is your personal online Jesus presentation. Create your link, post it, and see your impact. Together with 1 million Christians like you, each sharing their Jesus link with just a thousand people, we can reach 1 billion people together. Are you in? LinkU.co Welcome to Miracles. We call this section Miracles because we know that God can do anything at any time. That's right. Let's go ahead and pray together. Let's ask God to be with us this coming week. Lord, we are so thankful for your love for us. Thank you that you're with us every step of the way. Whether we're on the mountaintop today or whether we feel like we're in the valley, you are still the same and you never change. Lord, we're thankful for your consistency and that you're faithful to your promises. I just ask that you would be with our friends and our family members here at One Billion as they're going throughout their week this week. I pray that you would just go before them and beside them, that you would settle any issues that they have going on, that you would give them mental clarity and clarity of heart, that they would feel like they're just getting a restful time with you. So Lord, would you show up in their lives in a powerful way this week? Would you do what only you could do? And would you shake their circumstances and shake away the enemy's lies and deceit? God, go to work for them this week. I pray that you would do amazing things. And in your name we pray, amen. Well, God bless you, my friends, and I will see you here at Miracles next week. I was born in slum area and I thought I had no future because of the poverty. 
and have no confidence to talk with others but when I received Jesus Christ, He gave me a good future and now confidently to share His love to others. Jesus Christ loves you. Revival. I love that word. You know why? Because it means that we don't serve a God who is dead, but no, we serve a God who is living and active and moving the lives of people all around the world. Today, I want to share with you some stories of hope of people who have found Christ in their life. We have a woman from Ethiopia. She says, I just received Jesus Christ and I want to learn more about Jesus. Well, praise God. We'll be sending you resources your way. And also, if you're watching today, we've got an online church service that you can tune in every week. And we also have a man from the Philippines. He says, I just recommitted my life to Jesus. I have decided to recommit myself to God, hope, and pray that God will answer my request. Thank you very much. Well, we're so thankful for you out in the Philippines. You know, God is moving and doing great things. And we're so, so glad you recommitted your life to Jesus today. We also have a man from Bangladesh, uh, a very Muslim country. Uh, he said this, I received Jesus Christ. I love you, Jesus. Praise God. We also have a woman from Zambia in Africa. She says, I received Jesus Christ and now I want to start a Bible group. Uh, I need help to increase in my faith in Jesus Christ and build my entire life as a true Christian. Thank you. Well, praise God that you want to start a Bible group, a home fellowship. This is what this is what we're about here at One Billion. We're a family together. And together, as you start your church at home group, a Bible study, we're going to see God do amazing things. And then also we have another man from Cape Town. He says, I just received Jesus and Jesus is Lord of my life. Praise God out there in, in Cape Town, South Africa. You know, this month alone, we've seen many people come to Jesus. Uh, we've shared the gospel with uh, 1.8 million people and guess, guess what 52 million people saw our ads online and 10,000 people have given their lives to Jesus Christ this month isn't that awesome praise God hallelujah I used to live my life for other people making sure they were happy over my own needs but then I met Jesus now I live in freedom of people's opinions and desires for my life Jesus came to die on a cross for me and you so that we could live in freedom but a freedom where the future doesn't scare me my life is completely changed because of Jesus, and I want the same for you. Jesus just really loves you. As we wrap up today, we hope that you have been touched and blessed by this message. You know, this last part is called you because you matter to us and you matter to God. And you know what? The, the cool thing is that together we are a family. That's right. We are the church. And together you're not alone in your walk of faith. And we've provided here at One Billion some great ministry options for you. We have a program called OneBillionSchool.com. This is a free seminary for you to get trained in the Bible. Uh, we have a year of discipleship there. We're adding more courses to this school. So if you want to go to school for free, get a free education in Christianity, check out OneBillionSchool.com. And you know what? Join us every Sunday. We're going live all over the internet and uh, thanks so much for tuning in today but as we go let me pray for you God I thank you for our friends and family who are watching today from all over the world I thank you that you are with them and that you love them so much would you bless them today would you lead in God and direct their steps we thank you so much for giving us your word the Bible and Lord thank you that you are alive and living in Jesus name we pray amen well amen my friends we'll see you here next Sunday right here on onebillion.org Right now, there are more people on Facebook than there were on the planet 100 years ago. The planet Earth is more connected than ever before. Videos go viral. 80% of internet users own a smartphone. Content gets viewed by millions in just hours. And there's no limits to your audience. Countries are borderless. Five billion people have a mobile phone. And the world is set for a Jesus movement, like the world has never seen before. You and I are living in the biggest communication shift in 2000 years. Amazon has no stores. Uber owns almost no cars. Facebook creates no content. 
Airbnb owns no real estate, and Netflix is not a TV channel. The way people hear about Jesus is also changing too. OneBilling.org is on the cutting edge of delivering Jesus to the masses through social media and smartphones. Its plan is to give every person on earth and every nation an opportunity to come to Jesus right on their smartphone. And we also want to do it one billion times. Think about it. We want to share Jesus with one billion people. OneBillion.org has been paid for by ministry partners like you. If you'd like to be a part of the ministry and join us as a partner, you can at OneBillion.org. And you can see lives impacted by our program. God bless you.